Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I hope all of you are doing well today. So uh, this is going to be part two of my Q&A video. I received a lot of answers to uh, the question that I posed, which was, you know, do you, any of you have any questions you would like to see me answer on my channel? And I'll be answering more of them right now. And a few of the questions that I don't answer in part one or part two, it's because I'm going to answer them in their own, you know, video just for those questions because they actually deserve longer answers. So uh, let me go ahead and get into this video. Okay, so uh, somebody asked if you smoke herbs with her, will she give you some back? And I think pretty much the answer is no. Um, I don't see why giving her any kind of offering would mean she gives you more of that offering back into your life. I don't think it really works like that. It's not like a vending machine type of a vibe. Um, just uh, when you give her an offering, you know, you're giving her an offering because you just want to share something with her. You want to give back to her, not necessarily giving her something in the, you know, in the hopes or even expecting her to give you something else in return. Because um, it's at, at that point, it becomes really transactional. And with something worth it, you never want it to be transactional because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot more to that relationship than just give and take. Does Santa Muerte and St. Jude get along? I'm not really sure. I've never really asked. I've seen some statues that have both of them in the same statue. Often I see them in artwork together because they are both considered saints that are used for the downtrodden, the disenfranchised people who are having impossible cases. And so St. Jude and Santa Muerte, Jesus Malverde, um, other, a few other saints, they're all considered like impossible cases type of saints. The saints that will be there for you when nobody else is there for you. And that's why I think they get like kind of lumped in together. But the thing is, St. Jude is very much a Catholic saint. And although he is venerated by some of the same people who venerate, you know, non-canonized saints and folk saints, at the end of the day, he is his own being and he is a Catholic religious saint. And a lot of the time, these are, we forget that these are real people. These were real people. Like St. Jude is a real person. He was very religious. And I don't know that he would approve of being summoned alongside Santa Muerte or Jesus Malverde or any other beings, you know, that are not necessarily a part of that paradigm, a part of that religious perspective that he comes from. So, I mean, for all I know, they do get along. But if I had to guess, I would say they don't. Not that they're like beefing or having problems with one another, but I feel like their energies might be too different from one another. That I wouldn't even want to really put them in the same altar. You know, personally. Do I use a rosary with Santa Muerte or anyone else? I have used a rosary with Santa Muerte, but very rarely and not for a really long time. A rosary was one of the first things I bought when I first became a devotee to Santa Muerte. Um, I still have it, of course, it's put away. Um, but I've never used rosary with anyone else, I don't think. Um, I have worked with, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe, but I never really prayed the rosary with her. I did some, like, not magic with her once, but no, I only used the rosary with Santa Muerte, and even then, it was the Santa Muerte version of the rosary, not the traditional rosary, and I haven't done it in a really long time. How do I prefer to offer prayer? Um... Usually I will do it at the altar. So I do all my opening prayers, like the everyday kind of prayers for going to the altar. And once I'm at the altar, I'll usually speak and commune and just talk very casually at the altar. And, you know, talk about everything that I've been going through, different thoughts I'm having, places where I feel like I'm faltering or where I, you know, feel really happy about. And then I will, you know, at that point, I will be like, okay, I'm going to offer some prayers. I will say it just like that. And then I will start to say prayers. Sometimes they'll just be prayers of general things. Sometimes I'll be praying for something specific, but I usually offer prayer like during my communion time at my altar. That's when I most often offer prayer. Please, somebody asked about uh, seeing bubbles in their water glass for Santa Muerte and is she trying to tell them something with that? I don't usually see bubbles in the water glass. I do sometimes though, and I did recently. And so um, I think for me personally, when she shows water bubbles in the glass, it just means that she's present. 
and don't get too hung up on this because there have been times where there were no bubbles in the water where she definitely was present but i think sometimes once in a while it's just like a little something extra that she does she's always around when you're praying to her but sometimes it's like she just wants to throw a little something extra out there for you to kind of see visually and that will be bubbles in the water i've seen this just recently I replaced the water on both my Jesus Malverde and Santa Muerte altars and I came back in the room a little bit later and both of them had a lot of bubbles in the water and um, which was really cool so I would say if you see bubbles in the water it just means she's just kind of giving you an extra nudge just pointing out that she is around in case you were feeling like maybe she wasn't but uh, it's just a fun little thing that she can do from time to time although other people do have other interpretations about bubbles in the water and I do plan on making like a longer video discussing that in greater detail really soon. So somebody asked, does Santa Muerte have an official saint day? And the question, she does, but it's not really exactly official. Some people celebrate her on August the 15th and they will say that that's the official saint day for Santa Muerte. Other people consider her because she's a death deity, she works with the dead. They celebrate her on the time of like the Mexican Day of the Dead. So that's like November 1st, November 2nd. Um, you can really celebrate her anytime. Or you can celebrate her both on the November 1st and 2nd as well as August 15th. Which honestly sounds more fun to celebrate her multiple times a year. So uh, yeah, your choice I guess. Someone said, my mom doesn't let me have an altar to Santa Muerte because she doesn't approve of her. Is it disrespectful if I don't have an altar to pray to every day? No, it's not disrespectful. I think there are a lot of people who consider themselves devotees, who very much believe in and venerate Santa Maria that they don't have an altar because they can't afford to, because they don't have access to an altar, or because of their living situation that kind of prevents them from having one. And um, I don't think Santa Maria defines as disrespectful at all. She can really see all sides of a situation. She knows what we're going through. She knows how we're living and who we're living with. And I don't think she would want us to do anything that could potentially jeopardize our safety or our living situation, including, you know, our peace of mind. So um, I think she knows when we can and can't have an altar. So I don't think it's disrespectful that your living situation kind of makes it really hard for you to not have an altar to something worth it. I think you're good for now. Somebody asked how to properly take down and set up an altar, like if you were moving houses, for example. Um, for me, I don't really know if there's like a real, like official way to do it. When I moved houses, when I moved from an apartment into a house, I just took down my altar, put it all in boxes and I moved to the new place and set it back up. And that was that pretty much, you know, <laughs> I think, um, if you are, um, Maybe setting up a new altar in a new place for the first time. Maybe just have a little special something at the altar to kind of celebrate that it has a new location maybe. But if I was moving an altar from one room in the house to another room in the house, I probably wouldn't even do that. So I just, personally, I just took it down and then set it back up just the way it was before. Someone asked, is it okay to work with Santa Muerte if you were previously agnostic or not even really spiritual at all? Absolutely, you can work with Santa Muerte regardless of your spiritual upbringing or lack thereof. It doesn't really matter what you were really doing before as far as like religion or spirituality goes. It's just about what you're doing now and what you choose to do going forward. Someone asked, is it okay to start working with Santa Muerte even without knowing all the details of how to work with her, her traditions, her cultural aspects, all the rules about working with her? I would say no i think it's really i think it's best to educate yourself as much as possible i mean some people are already working with her without knowing the backstory of who she is or how she's normally venerated how she's traditionally worked with the cultures that she stems from things like that i mean if you i think it's just it's always good to know and i think it's respectful to kind of learn about that culture that she comes from, how she's traditionally worked with the traditional methods for, you know, reaching out to her and having her be a part of your life, setting up an altar traditionally. You know, I think it's a really important part of the practice, especially these days. 
I think as more time passes, things are starting to shift and change. I think that's normal with, you know, different spiritual paths, practices, religions, you know, when it comes to spiritual paradigms, you know, things shift over time. You know, Christianity today doesn't look the same as it did when Christianity was first starting out. You know, things change over time. And I think the veneration of Santa Muerte is going to change over time. And I think eventually, you know, I think the practice of working with her isn't going to resemble what it looked like when Santa Muerte's name first started appearing, you know, in the public's eyes, basically. So I would say it's true you can reach out to her and start working with her without knowing the rules the backstory the traditions but i think you would be doing a great disservice to yourself and maybe on some level to her to not really try to learn and educate yourself about her history her cultural impact and the traditions that her veneration kind of stems from are there any scary dangers you can bring on yourself um that's a really vague question. I'm assuming it's relating to working with Santa Muerte. Um, I would say, I mean, with any anything, there's a level of you know caution you should take. You're reaching out to a very powerful being, whatever or whoever you're reaching out to, whether it be angels or you know elemental spirits like you know fairies or whatever, you know whatever it may be. Whatever pantheon, whether it's the Hawaiian pantheon or the Aztec pantheon, you know, you always want to have a certain level of respect. And you also want to know what you're dealing with. So you always want to be educated. You want to do your research and know, you know, a kind of decorum that's needed to interact with certain kinds of beings. You know, you always want to be just very, you always want to be very respectful and um, just very honest. You don't want to go to these beings, generally speaking, you don't want to go up to them lying, trying to get things from them, trying to use them. You know, that's just not the way to do it. And so, you know, when it comes to a danger, if you disrespect a being, and I'm, it's possible to accidentally disrespect certain kinds of beings, but I'm more so really speaking towards being openly disrespectful. Like treating them like they're trash, like they are just there to be ordered around, like they're just a vending machine for you to give a petition to and all they're good for is fulfilling, you know, your miracle that you want or something like that. Or speaking ill of them or speaking down on them, you know, that kind of stuff, like that blatant disrespect. I think that's when you're the most at risk for potentially, you know, dealing with, you know, the wrath, the rage or the comeuppance that comes with disrespecting these beings. If you disrespected a person on the street, they would have something to say. And depending on the severity, they could get into an altercation with you. And with spirits, it's kind of like that. You know, if you disrespect them, if you start a smear campaign against them, they're gonna have something to say and they will react. Also, when it comes to spiritual work in general, if you're not properly shielding yourself, protecting yourself, cleansing you're at risk because you're doing spiritual practices that kind of stuff attracts ghosts it attracts the dead it attracts also astral wildlife spiritual parasites things that just kind of feed on your energy can make you tired and give you bad luck you know these little these little things so you just want to be cleansing properly so you don't have to deal with any of those like parasites and things of that nature where can you find more information on to go more in depth, I'm assuming about Santa Muerte. Um, really, you just have to do your research, I guess. Just read any books you can find, read any articles you can find, and use your own discernment to see what information resonates with you. You know, if you can, write down the information in your own notebooks, and you know, keep tabs and track of all the things you learn about, and just, you'll find that your knowledge starts to grow more and more or at least the information you've heard starts to become more massive and in-depth someone asked when it's time for a devotee to pass away what happens to them what becomes of them i think they read in a book or something that you know when a devotee's time comes Aunt martha will come and reap them with her scythe and i guess the wording of it sounded really scary or something 
um, it's more figurative than anything. It basically just means that whenever, you know, someone passes, she just comes to kind of collect her soul. And it's not necessarily that she, it's not necessarily saying that she is waiting in the wings with her, you know, sh sharpened scythe ready to like, you know, you separate, you know, head from body. She's just ever present. Because, you know, everyone's story on earth ends. And when that time comes, her spirit leaves her body. She is considered a psychopomp. She is considered one of those beings who ferries spirits to the next world. And there are other beings like this too. And so that's what it means. It's just her scythe represents, you know, the cutting, the severing of the thread of life. And it's more figurative when people say that she is going to slice you know, the thread that keeps you alive. You know, it's not meant to sound scary, it's meant to sound comforting. That when, you know, your time here comes to its end, which it will for everyone, you know, it's, it's very natural and it's very normal. And unlike some spirits who may be left to wander around on their own and not know what's going on, you will have the luxury of being able to walk hand in hand with her to your destination you know, safely, which is a really nice thing, I think. How much is too much to give to Santa Muerte? I think it's good to be generous with Santa Muerte and the beings that you work with, but you never want to give them so much that you leave yourself hurting. You don't want to give them like a meal when you're left starving, you know, you don't want to give them the shirt off your back and you're left cold and, you know, without. You know, at that point, they know how much and how little you can give them, you know, and if it's at the point where it's really hurting you or it's affecting you negatively to give them, then maybe you shouldn't be giving as much. And some people aren't in a position to give much of anything at all. And that's OK, too. You know, we just give what we feel, you know, called to give really. Is a handmade statue acceptable? And that includes like repurposed figurines. Like if you go to the flea market and you see some Day of the Dead statues or even like a Halloween skeleton Grim Reaper statue and you want to use that for your Santa Muerte altar. I think that's fine. Um, I think it's just about the, the symbolism. As long as the symbolism is there, I think that works. And I think you know, whatever you use, you always want to cleanse it. So if you buy something from like a Halloween store or something, just cleanse it. People, especially people and poor communities that don't have as much money or access to you know nice statues or even the internet they will make do with what they have they will make statues that are very crude they will repurpose dolls and things like that in order to have something to you know fixate their attention on at their altar so you can really use whatever you want it's just about the symbolism and the intent behind it and um, make sure you cleanse it also Definitely. You know, um, also it's good to maybe do a, a small dedication ritual to dedicate this item to Santa Muerte or to whoever it's meant to represent on the altar. Um, lastly, somebody asked what are the 13 promises Santa Muerte gives us? I think they're referring to in some books I've seen where it'll be, it'll say if you are a devotee, these are the 13 promises Santa Muerte gives you. Like you won't have a sudden that you won't pass away suddenly you'll have um 24 hours notice before you know your time's up um you know things like that and i think um i don't really know about that i think some most of them are true but they seem to vary from person to person it seems like a very just i don't know if it stems from um pagan practices because i know in wicca they have like the 13 um what is it? The 13 signs of a witch or something like that, where it's like a similar thing, really. Or is it the Wiccan read? Or the 13 goals of a witch, maybe that's what it was, which that's what it made me think of. So I think the 13 promises is just, um, it's just a list that people make to kind of quickly list out things that are pretty much a guarantee if you're working with Santa Muerte, although it does seem like this list can fluctuate depending on which book you're looking at or what article you're reading. So just keep that in mind, I guess. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. If you found some of the information helpful, then by all means, 
subscribe and give the video a like. I really, really would appreciate it. And also, I'm getting a lot of comments these days asking a lot of questions and I don't have as much time to answer them. But if you really, really want your question answered, you can um, become a patron over on my Patreon. Um, I think for as little as $3, you know, and at that point, you can ask me any questions anytime and I will answer them to the best of my abilities. And um, also, I post all the pictures that I show on my channel over on my Patreon as image sets so you can have access to all of those as well. So uh, with that being said, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you so much for participating and asking me all these questions. And I will see all of you in the next one. Take care.